say this here first. Okay. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. We pay homage to him and his teachings. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So today we're going to go into a different book. We are going to go into the Samyutta Nikaya, okay? And we are going to look at uh, the chapter, part, part of the chapter, two pieces in, the, in this chapter. Uh, this is chapter seven of the Idi Pada Samyutta. And it's the connected discourses on the basis of spiritual power. Now, the four bases of spiritual power are part of the 37 requisites of enlightenment. And um, I laughed when I ran into this because it's one of the things I could never make myself remember how to recite these four pieces. So every time I teach, I'm drumming it into myself to try to remember these. So anyway, we're going to read the, um, uh, you go to page um, 17, 1718, if you have the book, the Samyutta And this uh, part is uh, called the From the Near Shore. And this is the first sutta in this chapter, how this book is set up. So we'll listen to this first. And then when I run into some words, we reviewed this earlier today and found there were a lot of words maybe people are not too clear on. So we want to be very specific what they mean as we're going along. Excuse me, I have to keep drinking here. OK. So the first one is called From the Near Shore. Because these four bases for spiritual power, when developed and cultivated, lead to going beyond from the near shore to the far shore. And what are they referring to? They're referring to where you start when you're practicing meditation and your head is just part of everything. And you're trying to go to the far shore where you understand everything and your head feels a lot better when you understand how things work. That's what they're talking about. What for? Here bhikkhus, a bhikkhu develops a basis for spiritual power that possesses concentration due to desire and volitional formations of striving. He develops the basis for spiritual power that possesses concentration due to energy and volitional formations of striving. He develops the basis for spiritual power that possesses concentration due to mind and volitional formations of striving. He develops the basis for spiritual power that possesses concentration due to investigation and volitional formations of striving. These four bases for spiritual power, when they're developed and cultivated, will lead to going beyond from the near shore to the far shore. Now we're going to go through each one of these. The first one was developing a basis for spiritual power that possesses concentration due to the desire and volitional formations of striving. So when we look at this, the volitional, actually, I want you to be sure you understand what volitional means. The volitional is the act of making a choice or a decision, and um, in that it is has to do with, um, in other words, you're making a decision. It's about the will, about your will to do something, your decision to bring up the will to do something, okay? And 
the first one, you, the concentration is guided by uh, due to desire. And we're talking about Chanda here. Now, Chanda is a strange word. Chanda in Pali is a, what you call, I call it a neutral word because it can go toward the dark side or the light side. In this case, it's going toward the light side to desire and due to their wholesome desire and volitional formations. And volitional is the choice part, you see, um, of striving. And striving, remember striving, is the same thing as right effort. So when you see striving in this formation, you want to, you're talking about desire for volitional formations of striving to keep the striving going and the steps of right effort, keep practicing it. Because right effort is the part that is the cleansing piece and retraining piece for your brain. This is what leads you to change your habitual tendencies and habits into wholesome direction. In other words, giving up a lot of anger and learning to start dealing with things first with forgiveness and compassion and loving kindness instead. And um, this is what is the change part, the four steps of the practice in TWIM are teaching you systematically to first recognize any unwholesome mind state. And we have feelings in our life all the time where we feel just lost. And these feelings can fall into depression, can fall into sadness, can fall into an over amount of grief where grief can just overcome you, okay? And, and what we wanna do is we want to balance all of this out. So recognizing when something is, is going to interrupt what you're doing in life or what you're trying to study or what you're trying to um, concentrate on or work in your office or anything, when something is unwholesome that comes in your mind and jumps in to pull you down, this is where you go into striving to do what? Striving to follow the steps of right effort. Recognizing this is happening is because change happens in your body. And the change that happens in your body is the tension comes up and it gets tighter. It changes inside you or an anxiousness. If you're anxious, you feel a change in your body coming up. And this is where you want to recognize that as a cue. A cue for what? It's a cue for craving coming up, the like or dislike of what's happening. That's what it is. So you recognize the um, unwholesome mind state that is starting to happen. Then you release your attention off of that and you relax your mind. You relax your mind and you then you and then you that's the that's the cleansing part. And then you uh, re-smile as you return to what you're doing. And that is the retraining part. When I let go of something and I relax and, I, and then I smile and come back, I've done a whole cycle of cleansing my mind and retraining my mind to go in a wholesome direction. So we're teaching in a very basic operational way for you. So it's all about, does this work or not? And anything you can do to help yourself to make this work smoothly, that's what you want to do, okay? So next one is, he develops the basis for spiritual power that possesses concentration that is due to energy and volitional formations of striving. So whenever you are practicing, you are in charge of how much energy you put into your practice and balancing that energy. We're aware of it all the time. In the faculties, five faculties, we have uh, the faith that this is going to work, the energy, there's the energy, 
how much is there? How much do we need? We, we control that. No one else does. Mindfulness is the third part of the faculty. And that one is, can we keep our observation going? And your concentration level is controlled by those three, faith, energy, and mindfulness. And then the concentration and then wisdom is coming out and growing as when those four pieces are operating, wisdom is growing all the time because you're experiencing the cycle, cleansing, cleansing, cleans cleansing, cleansing, and, and um, lifting up and lifting up, you know, tree training, retraining is what I'm trying to say. Cleansing and cleansing and retraining, retraining, cleansing and cleansing and retraining and retraining. I love this. The repair people are out here. So we're going to have little <laughs> sounds. <laughs> this is great. Just right during class. Okay. <laughs> so here we go. He develops the basis of spiritual power that possesses concentration due to mind. Now due to your mind and your mind is steady. It is calm. And your mind has to be quiet, steady, calm, with strong equanimity to develop the spiritual powers. And that's how this all comes together and grows so that you can open the spiritual powers. Then the next one is he develops the basis for spiritual power that possesses concentration due to investigation and volitional formations of striving. So every time that volitional formations, um, of striving, bringing up the steps of right effort. That's it, of twim each time. And then these four bases for spiritual power, when they're developed and cultivated, they lead to going beyond from the near shore to the far shore. They support us to get on the raft and start going across to the far shore. Now that's just the first piece. Now the next thing that we do as we turn from there, we leave this section and we go over to number 20. And number 20, let's see, is called the analysis. 20 and then in parentheses, there's a 10. It's analysis and it's on 1736. Okay, now we'll start listening to what they're doing in the analysis. They're gonna to try to break down these four pieces for you. Because they're, these four bases of spiritual power, when they're developed and cultivated are of great fruit and benefit. And how monks are the four bases for spiritual power developed and cultivated so they're of great fruit and benefit? Here, a monk, develops the basis for spiritual power that possesses concentration due to desire and volitional formations is striving. Thinking in his mind, thus my desire will be neither too slack nor too tense. And it will be neither constricted internally or distracted externally. And he dwells perceiving after and before as before, so after, as after, so before, as below, so above, as above, so below, as day, so at night, as at night, so by day. Thus with a mind, that is open and unenveloped. He develops the mind imbued with luminosity. He develops the basis for spiritual power that possesses concentration due to energy, due to mind, due to investigation, and do the mind uh, will be imbued with the luminosity. So let's break this down a little bit. First of all, we go back to here where we say he develops the basis for spiritual power 
and possesses concentration due to desire and volitional formations for striving, thinking, this is my desire. Now, this is, Bhikkhu Bodhi actually sort of <laughs> said in the back notes on this that this is kind of overstated and drawn out, but what it really means is you do it all the time. And if you're at the level where you are going to attempt to open the itties, you know, and start to try to develop these, it is not an easy level to get to. And it is not, it's something you need to dedicate, not a week, not a month, not even six months, probably a year or two. And I have one friend who's trying to been doing it, trying to develop them for two or three years to get into the state that is the proper balance with these things so that this will functionally work, but we'll get to what it's about in a minute. So it's really saying when you're talking about, let's this, he gave you the outline here in the analysis. Now the analysis of desire as a basis, he's going to analyze what he's talking about for the um, desire as a basis. And also the word luminosity. Let's look at that one. Good. Luminosity is the light that comes from the person when they start to shine. It, the, it, and really what it's referring to, if you, if we were researching and testing with you and stuff, would be the moment that the vibration changes and starts to flow from the body or when the frequency changes in the person. And these kinds of things can be measured now. So when it starts to get brighter and brighter, it means that you are less and less doing anything and that you are completely rested in allowing this to flow out of the person. He develops the mind imbued with luminosity. There's literally a person can actually, you can literally see a person look bright. I, don't believe me, but it's true. And I've seen it. <laughs> and I say, how can I tell students what I've seen when I went to Florida years ago to a retreat Bhante Vimala Ramsey was teaching and I got there on the fourth day, they were already into this and they were already working on this. These were advanced students. And I walked, I arrived in the night, walking up the path to where this was and they're walking outside and I went in and Bhante was inside and I said, what's going on? <laughs> and literally the person can, you can see the person is bright. And it's not anything except the, the, uh, the level of the frequency inside of them. It's like a light bulb for heaven's sakes, but it's a very, very light, light bulb, but it's, that's what it's about. So when we go into the analysis of desire as a basis, what monks is desire that is too slack? It is desire that is accompanied by lassitude associated with lassitude and this is called a desire that is too slack and lassitude has to do with it's the investigation of being too slack it's the desire that is too slack it's a state of physical and mental weariness with a lack of energy this is what lassitude means and then you take uh, the lassitude concerning desire to slack um, your um, weariness of putting out your desire for this to happen. And it's easy for the mind to slip away here, slip away there into other thoughts. And, and a lot of people who like to analyze sometimes and are trying to practice, they, it's easy for them to fall back and to analyze, 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 question, question, when you should just be just sitting there and allowing to see what happens. Now here, um, what uh, monks is the desire that is too tense? So that was the one that was too slack. Now, is this, is, it is the desire that is accompanied um, by restlessness, associated with restlessness. And this is called desire that is too tense, okay? And so the, um, right, okay, I got that part. 
Now, and what monks is desire that is constricted internally? Now, see, desire is such a touchy thing. It asks all these questions about desire. Because what did I tell you in the beginning part of learning the meditation? In the early training, we want you um, to desire nothing to happen in the meditation. We want you to observe only or witness what arises and is there and passes away. So when we hear the word desire jumping up all over the place, it's a little disturbing, but you know he's trying to be very clear. You don't want your desire that is constricted internally. It, it is desire that is accompanied by sloth and torpor. So now we have um, sloth and torpor. And remember, sloth is slow. And like if this look up the sloth animal, he moves about like this as he's moving up the tree, sort of like this and then like that as he's climbing the tree this is sloth and the meaning of sloth is just that going way 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 um slow moving and torpor is dull mind torpor is dull so slow dull mind is sloth and torpor and that's one of your hindrances isn't it so associated with sloth and torpor and this is called a desire that is constricted internally. There's something internal that is making you go observe in such a way that is really slow and your mindfulness is not sharp. Okay. And what is the desire that is distracted externally? It is desire that is repeatedly distracted externally, repeated disturbed on account of the five chords of sensual pleasure this is called desire that is distracted externally and this is can be anything from sounds that are really bothering you and um, your eyes are closed but if someone is cooking the apple pie for tonight that can disturb you or there can be somebody burning leaves outside that can disturb you. Anything in the atmosphere can disturb you. With the nose, with the tongue, something can be left over from lunch or something that is not. And that's why I say to people, it's a good idea to wash your mouth out with baking soda and water, a little bit baking soda and water and slush it around uh, before you sit in meditation to take any, any kind of tastes out of your mouth. Um, and then you have the body. And if your body's uncomfortable and you're sitting wrong and something's disturbing you a lot, that's gonna, not going to work out when this is what you're trying to do. It's called desire that is distracted externally and won't allow you, because you're paying attention to it, it won't allow you. Remember I told you that the distraction is innocent. The hindrance is innocent. It's what we do with it that matters. It's how we decide to handle it. Once we understand that the hindrance has nutriment and the nutriment for a hindrance is our personal attention to the hindrance, then we learn to let go and relax and smile and come back and stay with what we're doing. So distracted externally, though, means these things that are going on outside, OK? And it's interesting because Vanti was always firm with me when he was training me over the years in the beginning, especially to go and sit by a waterfall or go sit where there was um, equipment in the distance going on in the forest, sit where there's noise. Um, if you're in a shopping center and we're having to wait for something, sit. <laughs> And if we're in an airport waiting, sit. And if you're in a train station, sit. And we tested this. He wanted you to understand that you can sit anywhere, anytime. And you can let these things go, letting sound go, letting odors go, letting go. And just concentrating, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. This is just an odor. This is just a sound. And it will always come, be there, and pass away. So there is no fighting with the truth of that. Okay, next part. And now how 
bhikkhus, does the bhikkhu dwell perceiving after and before? Well, as before, so after, as after, so before. How do they, how does he perceive this? Here, uh, the monk, the perception of after and before is well grasped by the monk, well attended to, well considered, well penetrated by wisdom. So this part about it's well grasped by the bhikkhu, it's well attended to, that part, is he has learned the Vadakarata Sutta. Very, very clear. And I don't have the book here, do I? Hmm. But you know, when we go back and repeat the, uh, the Vadakarata Sutta, just the front two phrases of that Sutta, we go to 131 in the Majima Nikaya. And when you go to the first couple of verses in it, that's the one they taught everybody um, in the villages, so they would never forget. Let not a person revive the past or on the future build his hopes, for the past has been left behind and the future has not been reached. That's the most important part right there, is the lesson of what is the past. It's gone, it's finished, it's fixed in time. There is no energy left in the past. There is no point on dwelling on the past um, you know, subject because you, you cannot relive it. You can draw lessons from it, certainly, in the present time, but you cannot get anything worthwhile for today from the past by going back and spending time on the past. And this is just an extension of that. And it's what it means when it says, basically, he, this person is, has well grasped the past and well grasped the understanding of the future to use in this exercise. Um, so it says well grasped by the bhikkhu, uh, let's see, well attended to, he handles it properly. Uh, any thought coming from the past, he lets it go. Anything of the future, he lets that go. Well considered, well penetrated by wisdom. He understands the past so finely as it stands in dependent origination, in human cognition, how it operates to the very smallest part. He understands it completely. It is in this way, monks, that a monk dwells perceiving after and before, as before, so after, and as after, so before. And how does a monk dwell? as below, so above, as above, so below. Here, the monk reviews the very body upwards from the soles of the feet and downwards from the tips of the hairs enclosed in skin as full, being full of many uh, kinds of impurities. And then he has learned this fully and completely, the verse to remember completely, there are in the body, head hairs, body hairs, skin, teeth, flesh, skin, flesh, I'm sorry, head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, and bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, pleura, spleen, lungs, intestines, mesentery, contents of the stomach, excrement, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, saliva, snot, fluid of the joints, and urine. It is in this way that the monk dwells as below, so above, and as above, so below. He has no particular part of the body he's attached to. And how monks, does a monk dwell as by day, so as so at night, and as at night, so by day. Here we go. I think we have to talk to the drug company, <clears throat> give you something that dries out your mouth in about three minutes. <laughs> okay, here, monks, at night, a monk develops the basis for spiritual power that possesses concentration due to 
desire, and volitional formations of striving by way of the same qualities, the same features, the same aspects, as he develops the basis for spiritual power by day. He does it by the same way he does it at day. In order to develop this whole thing, you have to be practicing all the time. Now, this is this kind of practice is not really something that's easy to develop at home. This is something that you've got to go away from a month to six months, really, in seclusion to just be doing it on your own. Nobody's interrupting you at all, where you're practicing this kind of development for this to happen. And um, or else by day, he develops the basis of spiritual power that possesses concentration uh, that is due to desire and volitional formations the striving by way of the same qualities, the same features, the same aspects as he developed the basis of spiritual power at night. So they're saying basically what you do by day, you do at night and it goes around the clock. And they'll probably sleep for maybe four hours during some kind of a training kind of thing like this. And it is in this way that a monk dwells as by day, so at night, and as at night, so by day. And how monks does the monk with a mind that is open and unenveloped develop the mind imbued with luminosity? Here, monks, the perception of light is well grasped by the monk. The perception of day is well resolved upon. And it is in this way, monks, that a monk with a mind that is open and unenveloped develops the mind imbued with luminosity. Let's see what I did here. Okay. Um, so we had, we did constricted internally and distracted externally is uh, repeatedly distracted by, um, oh, I'm sorry, constricted internally. I want you to remember narrowed, especially by encircling pressure in the brain. That's what's happening. When you have desire accompanied by sloth and torpor, you have a pressure that happens in your brain and encircles it and won't allow the development to happen. Now, distracted externally, repeatedly distracted by the five sense doors, we went into that and explained it. Well grasped by wisdom, I explained to you that's why what he meant by uh, dependent origination when we talk about the word wisdom. If we check it, and we say the same line, well grasped by uh, his understanding of dependent origination, it starts to make sense. That's all we're going to say about it. We're not going to tell you this is absolutely, you should change it to that. But if you start paying attention to where it says, and he um, practices with wisdom, or he, he has um, acute wisdom, or, or fast wisdom, or deep wisdom, or things like that, when those wisdoms are being explained in Anupada Sutta, he's talking about the way that he that Sariputta was able to watch dependent origination, how perfectly he could see it. I have students right now and I'm amused by them because one by one, there's four of them, they come to me and they say, you know, I'm starting to see dependent origination. And I said, yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> and they're starting to see it happening amongst people in situations with interactions they're starting to watch we're doing a lot of people watching where we are and where uh, we can watch it happening amongst a family situation or uh, argument over tickets if you're traveling things like this you can see the whole process of uh, the um, having some contact happen where someone heard something or they saw something or, uh, and then all of a sudden, it's see, see, mostly seeing and hearing something and the contact happens and the feeling comes up and it's painful and there's a layover and you don't want the layover. You don't like it personally and you don't like it because all the story runs through your mind. And then you get in the funk and you kind of sit down and uh, you don't want to be there for this layover or the kids are not happy or all kinds of things happening. And they're coming to me now saying, 
now that we know what it is, the human cognition, we can watch it happening in the people. And I'm there, that's giving you the inside view of how everything actually works. We talked about luminosity being the light, uh, light element, okay? And then now what we're into is, um, let's see, we're still going here, aren't we? Okay, we're not quite there. Okay, so now we do analysis of um, energy as a basis. And, oh, I know the word unenveloped. An enveloped mind is caught in one position, like the envelope is stuck. You know, it's enveloped means that like this. An unenveloped mind is an open mind. Okay. Don't know how they came up with that word in Pali, you know, because I didn't know they had envelopes. Okay. And what uh, monks is energy that is too slack. It is too slack. It is energy that is accompanied by lassitude, by lassitude. And we said lassitude is slack associated with lassitude. This is called energy that is too slack. There's not enough energy. And I just explained a while ago, you have to be able to control your energy yourself. And then what is energy that is too tense. Energy that is too tense is accompanied by restlessness, associated with restlessness. And this is called energy that's too tense. And if you're restless and you're moving or something, or you're anxious, or um, like uh, you're anxious or um, disturbed by where you are or something in the meditation, that's where you get too tense. And that's where this won't work when that happens. And then what monks is energy that is constricted internally? It is energy that is accompanied by the sloth and torpor associated with a sloth and torpor called the energy that is constricted internally. So that your constricted internally means the sloth and term, uh, torpor. And remember that the tenseness is investigation affected by restlessness, okay? And then what is the energy that is distracted externally? It is energy that is repeatedly distracted externally, repeated, repeatedly disturbed on account of the five chords of sensual pleasure. And this is called energy that is distracted externally. Then it is in this way that a monk with a mind that is open and unenveloped develops the mind imbued with luminosity. That's how the light comes up. The stillness is there, the absence of anything from the outside, the absence of any disturbance on the inside, and the stillness is there. That's how the luminosity keeps begins to come with a little smile, please. You cannot frown in this. You have to keep this my, like this. We haven't seen them, but they're getting close to it, but they're not here yet, but we're waiting for the Buddhists to come out like that. And I haven't seen them yet. I hope I never see them, you know, because that'll mean we've really gone downhill. But that's why the Buddha, if you see any Buddhists like that, you need to let me know. <laughs> okay. All right. Anyway, um, next part is section three. And this one is analysis of mind as a basis. And what monks is mind that is too slack? It is a mind that is accompanied by the lassitude associated with lassitude and called a mind that is too slack. And what is the mind that is too tense? It is mind that is accompanied by restlessness associated with restlessness and called mind that is too tense. So it keeps repeating this the same way. And then what is the mind that is constricted internally. It is sloth and torpor. This is called mind that is constricted internally. And what uh, monks is mind that is distracted externally. The mind that is repeatedly distracted externally, repeatedly disturbed on account of the five chords is sensual pleasure. And that one is called the mind that is distracted externally. And it is in this way, bhikkhus, that a bhikkhu with a mind that is open and unenveloped develops a mind imbued with luminosity, the only way it can happen. 
And then the analysis of investigation, the fourth part, what monks is investigation that is too slack? It is um, investigation that is accompanied by the lassitude associated with lassitude and called the investigation that is too slack. What monks is investigation that is too tense. It is investigation that is accompanied by restlessness and associated with restlessness. And this is called investigation that's too tense. And what monks is investigation that is constricted internally. It is the investigation that is accompanied by the sloth and torpor associated with sloth and torpor that is called the investigation that is constricted internally. And what monks is investigation that is distracted externally? It is investigation that is repeatedly distracted externally, repeatedly disturbed on account of the five chords of sensual pleasure. And this is called the investigation that is distracted externally. So we've looked at how this all affects the investigation. We've looked at how it all affects the mind. We've looked at how it all affects uh, the, um, right, all the four parts in their development. So then it goes, it is in this way that a monk with a mind that is open and unenveloped develops the mind imbued with luminosity. And the four bases for spiritual power have been developed and cultivated in this way. They are of great fruit and benefit. When monks, the four bases of spiritual power have been developed, the cultivated in this way, the monk wields the various kinds of spiritual powers. And I'll tell you what all of those are. Basically, um, I always wanted the first one when I was raising my children. <laughs> having been one, he becomes many, and having become many, he then becomes one. So it means that when the kids go to school, I can become many and clean the house and buy the food and take care of all the uh, things for the children that they need for sewing things and clean and washing and everything can be done by 10 of me. And before my husband comes home, I can come back and become one. <laughs> well, I never could figure that out. But anyway, it happened in the time of the Buddha. And um, I'll tell you about that in a second. But let me tell you what the ten, the, these different ones were. Having been one, he becomes many. Having been many, he becomes one. That's the first one. Mastery of the body as far as the Brahma world. He can go to the Brahma world and come back. He appears and he's vanished. He vanishes. That's the third one. The fourth one is he goes unhindered through a wall. If you have been around me, I've told you the story. Every January 1st, I try to do that. And the problem is that I still believe that I am here and the wall is here. And that's why I can't go through it. <laughs> okay, But I sort of gave up a couple of years ago. <laughs> but through the rampart, he can go through a rampart. A rampart is um, sort of a, a maze like maze thing on top of uh, a military installation and he can go through the rampart and come out the other side with no problem through a mountain as through space and then through um let's see dives into the earth as though it were water and they say that deepama when as an anagami she perfected that in india they say that she was able to perfect that and she would dive in and she would come up and talk to her teacher in India, then dive back down and then come back up in the United States. And then um, walks on water without sinking as though it were the earth. And so this is means that you're most all of this has to do with the elements and mastery of the elements, which is a whole other practice of mastering each one of the elements in order to be able to complete the powers, the four power, spiritual powers. Then another one is sits 
uh, cross-legged and travels through space like a bird. And there are these records in Sri Lanka that were interesting because they give accounts of there were so many monks going across the field. They had trouble harvesting the field because there was a big celebration and the monks were all flying across the field and they couldn't get the harvest done. There's a story about that. I thought that was cool. And um, the last one is uh, the divine eye and divine ear. Now, the thing is, those two are the last two. And um, so let's see, see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, and they put divine eye and divine ear together. Um, you know, sometimes you can have the divine eye and divine ear start to open, but in this day and time, we just don't use these things as much as they were using them in that time. But I have had some experience with um, divine eye and then some friends that are real high up on their development and everything have had some experience with divine ear. So divine ear is listening and divine eye is, is seeing um, different things, uh, earthly things and heavenly things. And it goes on and on like that. So, okay. So now he exercises mastery with the body. Uh, as far as the Brahma world, that also accounts for the Buddha, how the Buddha was actually um, doing this when he, the stories about him going up and teaching his mother and coming down, back down again. And um, Sariputta witnessing that and everything, seeing him leave and go to the Brahma world and come back down. So when the monks, when monks, the four bases of spiritual power have been developed and cultivated in this way, the bhikkhu, by the destruction of the taints in the, this very life, enters and dwells in the taintless liberation of mind. Liberation by wisdom, realizing it for himself with direct knowledge. So this is the whole account of this that is given here. And there are some other things that talk about the itties in this section, if you want to read up on them, it gives you some things that they talk about happening with different, different, um, the different ones. And it's a difficult thing to get involved in the itties. And the one friend from the student that is over in uh, Indonesia, when he's here sometimes, I. And mine, his name is slipping. I can't, I'm ashamed of myself. His name is slipping with my brain right now. Uh, but he's worked and worked on, on, on developing this. And I always talk to him about maybe you're working too hard. Maybe it's the desire to actually have it work that prevents it from working. But it's very difficult because the whole issue is in the case of the itties, you have to be gone. That's the problem with the itties. You have to be completely gone with your anatta in place. And when the anatta is in place, then a lot of the things they talk about, I'm sure, would be possible. But getting totally away from the issue of atta and the thoughts running through your mind and craving you're talking about people who are at least anagami and anagami with fruition being able to do some of these things. And some of us have had experience at times getting close to these and feeling like it's going on. And then they slip away because we don't pay attention to them all the time. And all of the parts that they talk about like this, that they talk about with the monks, um, it's a matter of how much you're going to be continually using the practice in order to keep these things operating. That's true with the elements, with the mastery of the elements also. It's true with determinations, how well you can develop your determinations. Um, if you're practicing it all the time, you can do quite a bit with it. You know, If you're not utilizing it all the time, then it, it's not going to keep working. And one of the things that they talk about with this practice uh, concerning the itties um, is that um, I say. Uh, some people want to say it's only the arahats that can have any experience with this. And it's not exactly true because some of the monks 
uh, were represented as very good at this. For instance, Mogolana had all of this operating just fine. He had all of it operating. But there were other monks in the stories uh, when you get involved in the different arahats that some things were working, but not necessarily all 10 of them. So let's throw it open for questions. We've got some time left here. And um, we've got about 10 minutes we've, that we've got here. <laughs> so any questions on this? No questions. <laughs> I can't believe. Okay. Um, then uh, let's see. Does, does anybody? You? You there? <laughs> can you see us? Hear us? I can't see you, but I can hear you. Okay. Hang on. You might be able to sort that. <laughs> it's not going to be clear. It's just clear now. Is that where is it? Oh, I see your finger. Oh, I see you. I see Sarah. Oh, hello. <laughs> nice to see you. Yeah, I was just um curious listening to this about the um spontaneous arising of some of these things moving into the cultivation. Because it, it sounds like from what you're saying, that there are development that happens when you're out of the way. So that feels to me like that's <clears throat> that's the complete alignment with the path. We're practicing to be out of our way, not to take yes. things personal, not <laughs> yeah. to not to attack. And, and so um, there's there's the development. When we're really out of the way, then 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 these uh, capacities, if you might, if you like, of the mind become. Uh, yeah, they do. That's how it happens. That is, you've got half of the screen is black and half of it is showing you. Okay. Oh, there you go. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, yeah, exactly so. Um, when you're not expecting it, it might start happening. That was my experience with listening to things and wondering, okay, what's going on? <laughs> you know, and, and, and um, but if I don't use that all the time, then it doesn't stay around, you know? And um, Bonte had some experiences, you know, Bonte, Bonte had some experiences where um, in, in Asia, he had a strange thing happening where he would put his hand down to the doorknob and there would be other monks with him. And it was freaking, it, it, you know, when you're a Westerner, you don't want things like this to happen because you're just ostracized and everything. But the thing was, they were witnessing it happening and he would put his hand down to a doorknob to turn it and, and the door would open before he touched the doorknob. And there's nobody on the other side. There's nobody there, you know? And he'd say, he did it a few times. And then he, he, he told me, he's just not gonna do that anymore because it caused too much of a ruckus. But there were witnesses seeing it. But what do we know? <laughs> and it's, you know, it's, it's a strange thing, but a lot of things exist about if you can do it, but nobody else can, how come you can do it? That exist amongst monks also, okay? They're not immune to that sort of stuff. And it makes it difficult. So, you know, he just didn't do anything to develop it. And so when some things started happening with me, I talked to him about it. He said, well, you know, if you're going to develop it, develop it. But if you're not, then don't expect it to hang around. So sometimes this is useful, but it's not always available because it's not tuned in. It's not tuned in very well. And I'm not usually in my life, my, the way I've trained, it's different because um, I've had to work as an administrator and a contractor and a farmer and built roads and done everything along with my training at the same time. And so uh, I would never have traded it away for anything else, but it wasn't like I was isolated in a monastery only and that's all I had to do. And so, I don't see where the time I spent on doing things 
uh, taking longer than other people is any not really true that much, except that I was slow because I, I had a stroke when I was in my 40s. And so I was slow in retaining things, but I managed, <laughs> you know, I managed pretty well. Yeah. So that, that brings me on to another question around this. So it's a spontaneous arising of a natural phenomenon from the development of mind. So why, what's the point of developing this? I can't quite see what the use is. You know, Sarah, I think that's kind of where this has gone because there's very few people in the world that teach this anymore. And this is the same thing that happened with the casinos. Uh, when we look at the casino practice, uh, I think we've we've lost how it was. It, it's definitely in there as a solid piece, but there's. I think someone told me only two places in the world where you can go and actually find a teacher to train, to actually mm -hmm. understand it the way it was being taught, and a lot of it is lost. And people have turned it just into a concentration thing on a point. You know, you put a plate up in a certain color and it, you, you, you keep staring at it and using it as a concentration thing. And we looked at it and we said, well, if for tuning your concentration or calming your mind down and then having the image when you close your eyes, you know, you know how you um, stare at a light bulb and then you close your eyes when your kids, you know, and the light bulb floats around inside your head, you know, you see the image for a while. Well, this is kind of like that when you close your eyes then you're going to see the image it's going to be there that you've been staring at for a long time but what is the purpose of it, it has to do with the uh, absorption and uh, one point of concentration techniques and so for us it's not we didn't find it that important i played around with it for a few weeks and uh Bondi told me he he played he worked around it for a while but he didn't see the purpose of it that much because of the way we're practicing and we're finding out that the that the real point of this um what is it uh, constricted internally or distracted externally is happening from us getting caught with things you know and mm -hmm. and we're we'd be practicing to be caught with this if we were watching it and just watching it and watching it until we had an image drama and it's i it doesn't help our meditation because we learned that if we step back and we just witness and don't take anything try to do it personal accomplishment personal 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 that everything goes faster and it works better you see and and in the sitters um do you, are, are there kind of descriptions of, I know there are descriptions of, of, the, of the monastics using the powers, but are there descriptions of how they were helpful, wholesome, skillful? Um, well, one, yeah, well, one of the things that the Buddha said about the powers, and see, this is also culturally a problem today. People want the powers so that they can go in front of a thousand people and walk on water. See, they did it. Somebody had the ability, the control of the um, elements in uh, Amsterdam and went out on the canal and started walking on the water. Well, see, the Buddha said that this is this is useless because the students who are coming to you are going to want to learn to walk on water. They're not coming for you for anything else. And, you know, the, you don't want the students to come to you because you were the one that could, you know, fly up to the top of the flagpole and bring the flag down. That's what Moggallana did in front of the monks. And after that, the Buddha chastised him and said, please don't ever do that in front of people again and told the monks, don't do this where people can see it. It was a kind of a private issue, you see. And uh, the, the story about the monk I told you I'd tell you was the one, uh, the Buddha had a meeting at the bottom of the mountain and the, monas the monastery was halfway up the mountain and they all came down to the meeting, but they were missing one monk. And the Buddha doesn't start his talk unless all his monks are there. And he sent the guy up, he's one of the monks up to get the other monk and he knocked on the door and no one answered. And when he opened it up, there were a whole bunch of monks running around. So he ran down again and told the Buddha, I couldn't get him to open the door, but you know, there's a lot of monks up there. And then, and the Buddha went, no, 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 no. Go back up and knock at the door. And when you open the door, you go like this, like that. And when you go like that, and all the monks went like that. And he said, you're late. And he took him down the mountain. 
So he's doing it privately. He's, he's done it privately to clean the whole temple. He probably was an obsessive compulsive on top of it, you know. <laughs> You know, he probably was suffering from OCD <laughs> and, and he wanted the place to be absolutely clean. <laughs> so he probably had a chance to do it when nobody was around and he just did it. You know, and then we hear another account of something where I, something about boats, I, it was some kind of an account about boats at one point. And uh, we, we don't hear about anything else after Mogulana got, uh, you know, chastised or, you know, what you call it, corrected by the Buddha. He basically said, please don't do that. And in modern times, if you understand how this works, in modern times, um, Sai Baba could make things appear. And so Sai Baba had 10,000, 20,000 people showing up. How useful it was, I'm not sure, but he did okay. You know, he, and he's not, he's gone now, he's not there. But, um, it isn't meant to be used that way. It's meant to be used to help people privately in private situations. And to, uh, if a person has a relationship with a deva, it isn't something you go out and tell people about. Um, it's not something you announce. If, if that person is fine, let them use the deva. I mean, that's fine. The deva's friends with them, fine. The deva wants to help. Devas are tricky. They're not going to come down here and march in and do the dishes for you, but they'll tell you a secret about who you can call or something to come and do the dishes. <laughs> it's very funny, you know, how it works. But anyway, yeah. So that's I think the story of this. Um, you know. Yeah, thank you. Hugh, Hugh says he's got a question too. Yep. I did uh -huh. just follow up on um, one of the comments you made there about, <laughs> about the uh, uh, casinos. <laughs> Why, why did the, uh, why do the casinos appear in the suttas at all then, if it's uh, a one-pointed, uh, a one-pointed practice? Because the suttas are accepted as a one-pointed practice. And it was a way of, you know, I can see where, when I was fooling around with them and practicing it for a while, I could see where it would train you to just come in like that and start staring but i just didn't see the worthwhile to keep it going that strong for that long and then going back in i could feel the difference of the pressure in my brain when i was practicing to see an image you know like putting this putting this on top of a fence and what and looking at it staring at it until i had the imprint in my mind and then yeah. walking back and then going through a dhamma talk uh, or sitting in a session i could feel this new kind of pressure in my brain and yeah. i didn't like it and yeah. i didn't see where it was useful but in an absorption meditation sure and um you know maybe so so the the problem about talking about the casinos is we really don't know and Bonti was frustrated because he would have to say he in truth he really doesn't know and we can't find out because we can't find teachers who teach it that can uh can can have it align with what the suttas are telling us about it. You see, there's people who will say, oh, we can teach the suttas. Well, there's people today who can invent anything, you know, yeah. that, that goes on, you know, and um, uh, I, I, but the good teachers are what we were talking about. The renowned ones are gone for this, you see. I wanted to ask Ajahn Brahm one time, you know, whether they were using casinos and whether that had been uh, done at all with Ajahn Chah, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if Bhante, are you here? Do you know yes, about uh, that? One more thing is that uh, Bhante Vimal Ramsey thinks that it may be kind of a corruption also for casinos. Uh, and mm -hmm. Ajahn Pram more, more kind of uses uh, this nimittas in uh, uh, meditation yeah, when you see light yeah, or something like that so they use that nimitta as a kasina if you kind of read it uh, uh, kind of carefully they use the yeah. nimittas as a kind of one pointed uh, 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 focus point if you get lights yeah. and many people in meditation do get uh, see lights and uh, a bright uh, uh, it's a, it's a kind of kind of like a moon, a moonlight that's small. It starts like this, mm -hmm. and then you can. I worked with it, 
And I saw what it was and I understood, but we take you to 43 and 44, where it's telling you that you give up uh, being concerned with signs if you are moving towards a signless state. And nimitta means a sign. And so by encouraging somebody to develop the nimitta like this, and develop it so that it's big. And then they'll say, you know, now make it go like here and make it go like here and make it go like here. And I'm sitting there saying, why? Because if you do these things with the brain, the brain thinks it wants to be trained to do that. And then you have to let go of it before you can go into uh, the deeper states and cessation, you mm -hmm. see? And the brain is tricky. The brain, the brain plays games on people, doesn't it, Bonte? When they're trying to get through uh, nothingness and neither a perception or non-perception to reach beyond that once they discover they're in it. A and lot the, of them think they're in it who are not in it, okay? And, and I love it when they come yeah. running to you to tell you how they're in. They know they're in neither perception or non-perception. I said, well, then you're not in it. <laughs> You know, and uh, one more thing about Ajahn Pram's teaching uh, is that uh, he uh, mentions that you have to be in that uh, concentrated sp uh, space, then come out of that space and then do vipassana or uh, do contemplation. Yeah. So this is not something which uh, is a kind of uh, anywhere in the text we can well, see. Well, this is the just from that. I, it's from that. I can't do that idea or concept of these two. <laughs> are two schools rather than two components of one meditation like this. They are two components of one meditation. In reality, it's stated in the text and re, you know repeated in a couple suttas about this um, being uh, yoked evenly together. And so they are happening. And I've been criticized because I say, well, they're yoked, to, uh, they are happening simultaneously and you have to be careful your words say simultaneously means you're here and while you're while you're in the samatha the this uh is happening and of course they're right it's not <laughs> it's like simultaneously with what what we're saying is you're practicing in this in the samatha and then all of a sudden this happens and then you fall back in again to the samatha is how this is working as a team but it's not you stop and then go and to another practice and play a, and do a second one. There's nothing in the text that tells us that exists. And it's fine if you want to try it, but it's, I'm just saying, I'm, we're trying to stay as close as we can to the text. And we're very pleased with what's happening as the result of staying close to the text, but it's up to a person to choose what they want to do. Of course, you know? Yeah. I think you have uh, time huh, for, uh... Uh, you had an uh, appointment, no? Yeah, I don't, just let me see if Pierre is here. Just a second. Okay. <laughs> she had an appointment for uh, yeah. physiotherapy. Pierre? <laughs> no, he's not here. We, we can go till he comes and tells okay, him okay. he's here. Okay, <laughs> you can ask the question. Yeah. yeah. I, I have one, uh, one more uh, observation then. Because the, the casino and the, the absorption uh, approaches this for me, because um, I had a lot of background in the Mahasi approach for 20 odd years. And that for me always felt like a subtle suppression of the hindrances. Yes. Um, and the one, -pointed, the one pointed exercises are very good at um, suppressing hindrances. So you begin to get some insight coming because the hindrances are, are absent, um, but it's not a sustainable place. Um, That's right. So I'm, so I'm wondering whether these techniques were, if you like, um, to uh, to give some insight quite quickly. Uh, th that would build some faith and confidence around the actual teaching of the Buddha, but not the technique. Um, yeah, I, but, I, I understand. I understand how you're approaching it. I do, but, but where I'm approaching it from the angle of what in the world um, happened back then that would have a, an actual culture and population decide to support these people. And I can't believe they decided to support these people because something was happening only for those people. And so my argument is that uh, I believe, uh, having you know spent the time I did in India that you know the people 
uh, especially in the villages and stuff, always think about this and the level of intelligence and just the way everything is, that they really had something given to them by the Buddha that they were practicing. Every farmer, merchant, person, storekeeper, everybody was taking and using that was actually giving them, uh, you know, giving them something to use in life. And I think the most important thing I've come to the conclusion in 22 years <laughs> is that I want to be working on something that's reaching out to people to take home and to use and to feel immediately relieved from suffering. And um, that that is the key point that Buddhism is weak in right now. Because, because yeah, that is the place where it's weak. And the place where it, it falls down is, is it willing to actually talk about itself, really turn in and examine itself uh, closely in relationship to families and people living in the world that he would like to have them coming to the temples and things. But they're not looking at the needs of the people so much and they're caught uh, more involved in uh, you know, the people come for celebrations. I mean, Sri Lanka is a perfect example. I mean, when I, I was at the first conference at the Bhikshu University in 2012, the first international conference at their university, and there were seven presentations, seven presentations that were done there on research of who comes to the temples in Sri Lanka. And the truth is, women, old, middle-aged, and young children with them until the boys are old enough not to want to come, but that the husbands and, and the men, if you ask them, why aren't you attending the temples, they will tell you right to your face. Well, to me, they would. They wouldn't tell Bhati, for instance, here. They wouldn't tell a monk this to his face, but they would tell me, why would I go to the temple um, other than the major holidays, why would I go every time when there's nothing they're giving me that can help me to better my family and, and make a, a better living? They said it right to my face. And I did about 12 or 15 men like that around in Pala Kelly's where I did that, Bonte. And then I asked people sometimes in Colombo, but not so much in Colombo as I did in Pala Kelly and up by uh, where the tooth was, you know. Uh, yeah. Candy, 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 candy in the candy area and Pala Kelly surrounding that area. And you would you would think this being the heart of Buddhism that they would wake up, but they are they are kind of caught. It's just like everybody in the world is caught right now in a system of seniority. And what seniority says you will do, you will do. And I can't find any religion where that's not affecting the religion right now. I think that's a problem, you know, and I, I have remarked to monks many times as an old Christian, if in a church, a minister was not preaching from the Bible correctly and was going to politics and all over creation instead of what he was supposed to be doing with the text, they would have a meeting and a board meeting and dismiss him and hire another minister. But that is not the case in Buddhism. And where we go, I do not know. But I, but then now look again, the, the monks that I worked with on their theses and helping them with uh, their theses while I was in Sri Lanka, those monks uh, are in, and all the monks Bhante and I met around, you know, the same age. Uh, they're like in their 30s, uh, 20s, late 20s and 30s. And they're going to make a decision. If this whole thing doesn't look at itself pretty soon, they're going to fold their robes up and up, put it on the steps and walk away from the temples. And I heard uh, one of those research projects back then tell me there are hundreds of empty temples in Sri Lanka and they're not occupied. Bonti knows this is true, right? You know. And, and the reason is because, why? Because the structure isn't paying attention to what the people need. Why should the people come? It's a wonderful organization. It was structured correctly. The, bene the benevolent dictatorship works. It works. But it only works if you are in, in connection with the people and what it was for and everything. And if, mm -hmm. if we're, we're caught in a, in a vicious point here, kind of funny circle, it has to climb out of it and or else it it'll disappear. That's all. And, and this century, this century is going to press it. This century is going to press it. It's what's going to happen. 
I, I've, I've, done a, I've done a little bit of research around this, but uh, looking at what happened in the sort of um, two, three, four hundred years after the death of the Buddha. And there was a similar pressure in uh, ancient India as well, because what became very popular were the mantra um, uh, processes uh, mm. in the Shiva and Vishnite uh, traditions. Um, and then there was a whole process going through at that time of who would get patronage because the large monasteries needed to be funded and they needed a, a, a patronage and all the rest of it. Uh, and there seems to have been a whole process where uh, the, the presentation of the teaching uh, was very much about um, uh, what could be done to make daily life better. Um, because that's what would encourage more people to come and make, make the, the uh, uh, monasteries, if you like, more relevant and um, uh, uh, more sustainable. Um, that's and exactly, the, and that's the, exactly where I am, exactly. And, and the mantras, and the mantras um, uh, in the Shivite tradition and the Vishnite tradition uh, were deemed to be effective in terms of making people's lives better. So then they became quite a um, mm -hmm. they became quite a resurgence in the area around that, um, and so you get by about three four hundred years after the death of the Buddha um, a a um, a sort of uh, a constant um, flow between Buddhism in, in what was then two or three different presentations because it, it split and, and there were uh, there were different uh, emphases in practice and within the Shivite uh, traditions as well. Um, and so the thing that you're recognizing today is if you like a perennial, a perennial response as we as you move away from the uh, veracity and clarity of the initial teaching. That's right. And, and the, the only reason that this, um, this ha happened, I, I think I've had this discussion with Bhante a few times too, from Bhante Dhammagavesi, is that once you get the problem for this practice we're showing you is it existed in the very beginning, right effort operating as right effort. We cannot tell you when this got messed up, but in translations, it's e pretty easy because striving sounds really hard, doesn't it? it sounds harsh. But striving actually meant striving to do the instructions correctly and keep doing them correctly. Striving to do that. It didn't meant, mean put your shoulder to the wheel and put all the power you possibly can into it and that sort of thing. And then the word effort was a dangerous word in translation. I don't know what we could have done instead of that translation, but the problem with effort is people will only go to a dictionary. It's a very good example and, and read one definition for effort when a word could have six definitions and I asked someone the other day if you were in a Spanish class and you had to give uh, the teacher the answer to 25 words tomorrow and you forgot to do your homework and you're going to go to the dictionary to find out what they mean are you going to what are you going to do you're going to go through the dictionary and write down the first definition for everything and go to class it was so easy to lose right effort. It was so easy to lose it because there was such a big push for we have to move our lives from the unwholesome to the wholesome. So let's just uh, call this effort, persevere, work hard, and really push for the whole eightfold path. But what you did was you lost number six. You lost right effort and let, and right effort sits there as a key. Look at it. Even today, you'll find books written about it today. Uh, you can find them on the internet. The four uh, practices of right effort, not the four steps in a practice of right effort. There's a slippage for you. Okay, now it's four practices involving right effort. That's not what it was. It was one practice that had two steps to purify the mind and two steps to retrain the mind. And it was perfect. And we lost it. And it's time for this to turn around because any monk can use just that practice and almost nothing more but a puja ceremony and the some of just the basic 
chanting, you know what I mean, like the Mangala Sutta, Ratana Sutta, and, and maybe the, uh, you know, what the dependent origination on, uh, what is it called, Apana, and the up and down of the, that one, that, that chant. And a couple others I prefer, like if you're in the forest, the ones you got to talk about the two leggeds and the four leggeds and the six legs and eight leggeds and wish them well before you go to bed. <laughs> you know, but I mean, and the blessings of everything can stay just the way it is. Everybody knows about all the blessings they do at temples. But the thing is, it's the practice and you can keep the breathing practice. Keep it by all means. When you first come and you've never done anything else, when I sat down and did the breathing, the first two weeks I was with Monty, I felt like I couldn't believe why didn't anybody just tell me to sit down, be quiet and just breathe. <laughs> why? And I felt like a new person. But it's, it's, a, it's a method of calming down to do this practice. This is the practice that changes the human being, that changes the person from thinking about ill will and cruelty and discontent and aversion. This is the practice. Breathing doesn't do that. You can say anything you want about breathing, but when people leave that retreat, then everything drops down and they go to the next retreat and it drops down and they go to the next retreat. We're talking about a system to free yourself from suffering in daily life and use it in any situation. No, That's what, what we're talking uh, about. Uh, they, uh, Hugh has told is kind of uh, interesting because see, what I think is that the chanting kind of uh, depressurizes you. It's kind of if you have worries and you have a kind of uh, thoughts coming and when you chant and they chanting, they are kind of very good at the chanting process because I, I also for a brief period did the chanting thing. Uh, so the yeah. uh, chanting uh, kind of de kind of uh, stresses you because you forget about whatever is happening. Your thinking process kind of gets stops when you are continuously chanting at that uh, uh, period of time then what happens is when you go to, in life you have no kind of uh, tools to use that you again the right. stress builds up and again you come to the uh, temple again or uh, or a place right. uh, where you meet and then again you chant and again depressurize so this is a depressurization uh, uh, is a cycle which does not end because you are not learning anything about how it is functioning so what you are saying is right. very kind of uh, 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 kind of uh, important. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, Go ahead. The, chant, the chanting, uh, and there's been quite a lot of research on this now because uh, this aspect of uh, physiology is becoming very popular. And it's all about the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is the primary conduit of the parasympathetic nervous system, rest and digest. It's the opposite of fight and flight. And chanting, because it uses... The, the larynx and the pharynx. And these are muscles, they're very, it's very unusual for the vagus nerves to innovate muscles. And it's mostly a feedback mechanism. But some of the muscles that they innovate is, the, is, is in, the, in the throat and in the sinoatrial node of the heart. So the, when you activate the vagus nerve, you activate the parasympathetic nervous system, that's the calming down, and you also change your heart rate variability. So physiologically, there's a very significant uh, impact um, with, with the chanting. Um, and, so, and that's independent of, if you like, what you're chanting. Mm. Yeah, uh, I think that's true. That, and also don't remember, what is it? Is it 428 hertz, 428 hertz? If you take the, uh, you, you take the core, uh, crystal bowls, and you work to, to for the for the relaxation for body scanning and stuff that Bonte used to do way back before he was a monk. Okay, and and the four twenty eight, I think it's four twenty eight or four fifty eight hertz. Okay, anything that's in that level is going to do exactly what you're describing. Okay, exactly. But so it's that it's that level that calms that uh, the vagus nerve and calms everything down and and makes everything totally totally calm so even listening to the to one of the one of the um uh the crystal balls if you if you go on go in your computer and pull up the um playing the uh crystal balls i can't remember it's it'll pop up and there's like a three hour one in there i love it they can turn it on and go to sleep and it'll stop afterwards you know 
and it's absolutely fantastic. And one of the students here, he just couldn't rest. We have difficulty resting because it's light so long where we are. And there's only a short period of darkness and the light comes back at 2.30 or three o'clock in the morning. So only a short period of dark. So everybody in this whole, whole development is shade, shaded. We, all apartments are shaded dark at night. I'm fascinated with this whole system of living. It makes me want to re-look at history and how things could have happened in all this light, you know, <laughs> up here in this, I'm up in the north, you know, in Poland near the Baltic Sea. So uh, it's interesting, but the four, I think it's 458 Hertz. I can't remember, I can't find it. Let's there was, an, uh, I think, an uh, app also where uh, anything you play, it plays at that uh, frequency. Yes, uh, Sarah. Oh, uh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. We play the Eagles and have them in that. <laughs> <laughs> have them play in that, that would be really funny, yeah. It's, it's a wonderful thing. So I told him- Sarah we has a question. Yes, yes, ask her. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, something came to my mind um, while you, you've all been discussing this, and it was around the um, nature of the mind moving into absorption to access these powers. And just what came into my mind was around the, the way that um, that we, we practice yoga and how, how and I, I want to maybe ask you to explain this better than me but he's he I mean he, he's not floating through air and walls but he does float in his body but he does it without an absorbed state of mind he does it completely with a relaxation of the mind the mind being out of the way and there's a transparency that comes through now I am not at all as adept as him I have glimpses of this but what's interesting is it's not coming from a place of an absorbed mind. It's coming from the twin mind, which is released, relaxed and smiling. And when that is present, there's a capacity to move with the body where you're basically moving through space in the body. And the only elements that you feel are the contact with the earth. Everything else disappears. And I just That's think this is really interesting because... It, it, that's a different experience from, from the absorption that you're describing um, with, with these powers. So um, I just wanted to, I wanted to mention that because that's, that's the bit of the confluence that I find fascinating between um, the physical yoga practice and then the, the mental yoga. I know Sister Kim has referred to it as that before with, with the twins. So this is like an embodiment of it and the capacity of the human body, um, it's, it's completely, you're not in a mundane body anymore, if you like. You're in a, I don't really know how to describe it. It's, it there's, a, there's, there's a material form that begins to move through space. Mm -hmm. But in mm -hmm. our practice, we're rooted onto our yoga mat. We're not flying through the air or anything. But I, mm -hmm. I, the book that's interesting is, it's not with an absorbed mind. Mm -hmm. So I just I yeah. want to mention that to you because I think that's that's a very um, that's well, an they, they don't, yeah they don't really tell us you know anywhere uh, in it is uh, and uh, what is his name in Indonesia he was here he was always interested in the idis do you remember who I mean. Uh, Ardika. Yeah, Ardika. It was Ardika. That's right. It was Ardika. Yeah, and and he can't find anything that's talking about whether it was in what mind state they were doing this. And he's been looking and searching for different types of. of uh, but, uh, in many uh, sutras, it has been mentioned that after the fourth jhana, you will be able to kind of uh, develop those things. Like uh, one example, as yeah, you have as, to as be. A, uh, you have to be as a pot, a uh, pot is full of water mm -hmm. and it can bend in any direction. So at that point of time, you can bend your uh, uh, kind of inclination towards uh, this thing, uh, it is, and you can develop your it is. And other thing is that uh, what you kind of describe is that uh, it, you may be kind of going into, uh, uh, if you're using twin uh, while doing yoga, uh, you may be going into a jhana state where you may uh, not feel the body, uh, but you have contact with the uh, earth kind of thing. 
so where you are feeling that is a kind of a classic uh, explanation of the fourth jhana state while your uh, body kind of uh, you are not feeling yeah, so that I, I, yeah. yeah i remember i was practicing and uh, we went to um it was in arizona in tucson i think we did a retreat and i was i was literally caught in this level of just no body right away when i was sitting just no body at all and so when we went in, he said, she's right there. So don't anybody bother her, you know, and I was walking down the halls and I said to him, he said, well, what are you feeling? I said, the only thing I can feel are my feet touching the ground. That's all I can feel. So I was actually moving in it and it's easy to move in first or second or third jhana, but I was able to just walk, but I couldn't, I couldn't have gone to work really in fourth jhana, I don't think. I could have really gone to work, but I could have still kept, over the years, I've figured out that when you're developing your equanimity and you get it going really strong a number of times, then in life, there's a residual that someone asked me just the other day. They said, you don't jump at anything. No, it's like a, a, a lawnmower backfired and all these people jumped and I just was walking. I didn't even jump at all. I said, so obviously you're retaining, not, not, being disturbed by sounds or smells or things. And I didn't think about it until that happened the other day, you know? And um, so, but when you're practicing and you're really working hard in a retreat and you get things, uh, you know, going really well, then she's right. I mean, and you're right. You're just touching the floor, just the ground, you see? And it, that's the only connection that you have anymore. It's the, it's the point that holds you for just being grounded to walk. And it's a special thing. It's really interesting. I'm just wondering around this, um, maybe Hugh can come in, about the, the combination of the, the very relaxed, um, eased out balance that, that can evolve, um, coupled with the intention. And that's, that's what we would, that's how we would practice in, in the yoga, so that there's a transparency of mind and body but there's a very clear intention of how we move. And so that's the bit which you could say, I don't even really want to use the word absorbed, but it's like everything is really aligned. There's, there's nothing else that's getting away in, in the way of that intention, but the attention is totally spacious. And that oh, seems to be, yeah. the, there's an absence of tension in the body and, and the body moves with an incredible lightness and, and actual incredible speed. Well, you yeah. know, your yoga and your sets of yoga are similar to karate in the katas that we do in karate. And the katas that we do in karate, once we memorize them, we don't even think about them anymore. Our body has embodied the movement from this one to that one to the move. Like if you're doing I was explaining cipher to somebody the other day in the uh, brown belt level, you have to learn cipher and it's a circle, a circle kata. So there's nine guys in this, there's nine imaginary people there and you're working you're, that, like you're fighting those people. And it, the, it's beautiful when you do it slow and perfectly perfect, you know, when you're doing it. But I, we don't think at all about that. Once we learn Saifa and he drills us and drills us and drills us, then when we do it, we don't think about it. We just flow through it. So I'm wondering, are we in an absorption at that point? Or are we just, just simply turning on the record and going through the whole thing? You see what I'm saying fluently and then getting to the end of it. So I don't I know if it's the same as absorption. I, or maybe it's not as tense as absorption. Yeah. So I was just using this as the lens through which to explore these casinos and whether um, the, the quality, if you like, of, of mind is one where the attention is really spacious, but there's such a clarity of intention and, uh -huh. and using that slightly different language from absorption is, is the development that, that they, were, they were exploring. So very Probably. much. It could have been, it could have been. Well, anyway, I think we need to wind down here. <laughs> but this, you know, this whole little scenario here we, is kind of fun for discussing topics. If we had a couple more people, we would really be going uh, that we're willing to come in, you know, with us 
to take a topic and actually talk about it sometime. Yeah. So we should consider this because I think this was actually a fun time to do this this time, huh? So I want to thank everybody. And I know I either missed my appointment or I'm going to slip in late. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't come to get me yet, but they'll ring a bell for me usually. Anyway, um, yeah, so uh, next week we'll go keep going and write me a note if you have ideas for uh, topics you really want to hear about. Please write a note to us and let us know because we like to do that. If somebody calls, we will go into a direction, okay? Okay. So let's say a prayer okay may suffering one be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be may the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief may all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness may beings inhabiting space and earth devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.